Hi, my name is Jeff Noonan. I'm one of your elders. Um, you usually see me if you're pulling into the parking lot. I'm the strange looking guy, kind of the sometimes creepy looking guy standing in the parking lot with a bag and doing security. That's because my, my normal job is I work for the sheriff's office. I've been there for 28 years with the county for 30 years, and I'm the number two there. So it just it's kind of natural for me to fill in here and help with security. But today, God allows me to uh, preach for him every once in a while and share his word, and, and Scott is, is uh, willing to ask me to do that. So it's just a blessing for me to come and share what's on my heart um, and what's, what's been on my heart for a little while. In fact, before Scott even chose the Three Kings series, my small group and I have been going through First and Second Samuel. So it's been part of me, part of how I um, have been going uh, through uh, each day. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to share with you David's heart today. But my first question to you is, what impresses God? How do you impress God? How do you, what, what, what comes to mind when you think about impressing God? Is it money? If God truly owns everything, if everything belongs to God, then it can't be money. What about education? If God is the alpha and the omega and he's all-knowing, then it can't be education either. What about thunder and lightning? If God is able to dictate when lightning strikes and when the thunder roars, and if he's created all that, then it's surely not strength and power uh, that impresses God. What about the purple mountain majesties? If God created the sun and the moon and the purple mountain majesties, then it's clearly not our artistic ability. What about the songbird? If God created the very laws of physics that allows those frequencies to vibrate our ears to that melodious song, then it's not, it's not the songbird, it's not the song. Now, I, I, I would submit that all of these please God if they're done in accordance with his name, but I don't think they impress God. What impresses God? We're going we're gonna to look at that. We're going to find the answer, at least a partial answer to our question and the subject matter that we study here this morning. God's anointed, David. We know David as the second king of Israel. We know David was a man after God's own heart, which is told to us in 1 Samuel chapter 13. And how do you, how do you describe that? You know, the Hebrew meaning for heart has more to do with emotion. It has to do with um, tactful, you know, our, our, our tactfulness when uh, dealing with folks. But it has to do with our intellect and our desires. When Israel demanded a king, they wanted a king that was formed after, so God gave him Saul. They wanted their own king. Gave him Saul. Saul was handsome. He was taller than everybody. And, and Saul was also arrogant, he didn't follow God's, God's commands of him. And God got a little tired of it. And so we see that, that God decided to have, um, pick, a, pick a, a king after his own heart. And so we see that Samuel goes down and he starts to, he needs to anoint um, someone after God's own heart. So we see David has seven brothers. We're kept closer. His seven brothers, his older brothers were kept closer to the farm than David was. And David, um, David was sent out to the mountains. David was sent to the mountains, and he was to tend for the sheep. And so I picture David up in the mountains, and I picture David tending his sheep, and I picture him kind of like I was, was as a boy, kind of passing the time any way he could. So as he tended his sheep, he took a few instruments with his tools. He had his shepherd's staff. He had his sling and his rocks. He had a small instrument that, that he played to God. And so he's up in those mountains and he's fellowshipping with the Lord. And as he's watching his sheep, every once in a while he takes his sling, he picks his five smooth stones, and, and he starts to pick targets. And he starts to punish trees one after the next after the next. Just like any boy would do. And so 
as he's punishing these trees, he's getting better and better to where he can precisely tell where each stone needs to go. And so, have you ever thought about how that, how that works? This is how that works. And before I became a cop, I actually got out of the army to come here to go to Amber Riddle. I, was a, I, I loved physics, believe it or not. Uh, I was a math major. I wanted to fly. But God had something else in store for me. So if you look at this, this uh, equation here, what you'll see is you're going to see how this all works. The, cir the circumference, and you, there's some math majors, probably some physics majors in here. But what we, what we surmise is that is that David's sling was about 0.88 meters long, right? About three feet long, if, if you will. He could swirl that thing around his head every, uh, one revolution every 0.2 seconds. Every 0.2 seconds. That's what this is telling us, right? So you have the, the circumference of the, the sling, the time, so you have 5.5 meters, 0.2 seconds. What we know is that when you practice this enough, you can hurl a stone that's one ounce about 27 meters per second. 27 meters per second. You know how fast a bullet comes out of a 45 caliber handgun? 150 meters per second. 150 meters per second. So as David is, is learning and he's communing with God, I believe that God is forming him into who he needs to be. He's fellowshipping with him. He's molding him. I have a story about this in my life because when I was seven years old, I felt, because this is a story, we're going to talk about David and Goliath. This is a story that you hear in Bible study and, and all throughout kind of your, your adulthood. But when I was seven, I thought, I could do that. I could do that. So this is back when there were no cell phones. Cell phones didn't exist. Our TV was this huge Curtis Mathis TV that had 12 channels and a table or a turntable on top that your parents told you to get up and go turn the channel when they needed to turn the channel. So we, we were outside all the time. Sun up to sundown. Well, I was outside, and I thought to myself, I'm going to make myself a sling. I'm in the backyard. We had this, all these rocks in our backyard because we lived in Phoenix. Grass didn't exist down there. And so I got this stone. But unlike David's sling, mine wasn't three feet long. It was about five, I'm guessing five feet long. It was almost as tall. It was taller, taller than I was. So I put this, I picked a stone, and I put it in the end of that rope. And it wasn't, it wasn't one that you, it's just a loop on the end of the rope. I start twirling this thing. I'm twirling it and twirling it, getting faster and faster and faster. And that rock left that rope a little faster than I thought it would. And it went right through my parents' bedroom window. Just shattered this. And I'm standing there. If you can picture me, I'm, I'm tiny. You know, I'm seven years old. I, you picture me standing there. I just see this window shatter. And on the other side of that window was my dad. <laughs> standing there. Looking at me. And he had this look of bewilderment on his face. Kind of shock, bewilderment. The funny thing is, I don't remember exactly what my punishment was. I, I, I don't remember. I just remember to this day, and God loved my father. He passed away about seven years ago. I remember the look on his face, looking at me like, did you just do that? <laughs> he, and, you know, he, he probably didn't have to ask it out loud because I was the middle child and I was always up to no good, you know. <laughs> But this is, this is um, the picture that I have of David and his youth up in those mountains, taking care of his sheep, fellowshipping with God, growing with God. And we know that every time that his sheep was attacked, he interceded for his sheep and he took care of them. To me, that is an example of his heart as it related to his sheep, but the, the relationship that he had with the Lord. The Lord interceded for David. The Lord molded David, much like the vision that we have today 
and the fact that God intercedes on our behalf. This is what David was. He was growing. At night, he was singing the old hymns to the Lord. During the day, he was punishing trees. You know, I just picture that. A little better than I was, you know, but punishing trees with those rocks. Be done, walk over to the tree, pick up his rocks, pick another tree, tree after tree after tree, boulder after boulder. This is where David lived. This was his territory. But what, it's a, what it is an example for me, when we read Samuel and we, talk, we start talking about God picking somebody, a man after his own heart, that is my big idea for you today. As we start to pick apart these verses and we go through, I just want you to ask yourself, where is your heart? Where is your emotions? Where is your intellect? Where are, is your focus? Hopefully it's on the Lord. But as we know, our hearts, unfortunately, are desperately wicked. In Romans chapter 3, it tells us, there is none righteous, not even one. And verse 23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. I walk through this life like many of you. I have good days, I have bad days. I had good week. All week long was a good week. This weekend was a struggle. Last night was not a good night for me. I'm the number two in the sheriff's office. Last night we had an armed robbery. We had an individual uh, attempting to take an ax into a care facility to harm people in the care facility. SWAT had to be called out to, to get him. We had to use a dog to save his life so we didn't have to shoot him. At the same time, one of our jail facilities lost all power. All power. And to top it off, I have many people fighting wildfires all over the county. Right? It was not a good night. Not a good night. But that's normal. And I'm sitting here as I'm preparing for this sermon. I'm thinking, Lord, just let me focus on the sermon. But all of those divisions report to me. And it's just, the, but that's how our life is, right? It's boom, 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 boom. And I think it's this world trying to cut us down, trying to take our focus off, off what it needs to be. And I feel David in his youth in those mountains taking care of the sheep was God's way to mold him for what was to come, to prepare him for what was to come. I ask you today, as we go through this, where is your heart? Where is your heart? A good example of this is found in Samuel, when he goes to, to anoint Saul's successor. See, Samuel goes to the house of, of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, and he gets to the house, and there's eight boys, right? We hear there's eight boys, but there's only seven around the house. And that's because Jesse kept the, the seven that were older than David closer to the farm. And he sent David away. So Jesse, or, uh, Samuel gets, gets to the house. And he, 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 an, he anoints the household. He prays with Jesse. And then he says, bring him, bring him to me, right? The first one, the first son, Eliab, he's like, well, this is, surely this is him. Surely this is him. Or it's like, nope, not him. Boy after boy after boy, it's not him. And what does the Lord tell him? Something that, that is such an important lesson for us. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Where's your heart? Where is your emotion? Where is your intellect? Where is your feelings? That's what God was after. He had already given Israel Saul, who was the man that Israel wanted. Now Saul was saying, it's my turn. It's my turn. So, so then Samuel asked, is this, is this all you have? He's like, well, I have a boy. 
I'm paraphrasing. I have a boy that's out in the mountains taking care of the sheep. He's like, well, go get him. Go get him. Bring him to me. Goes, gets David. David comes in. And the Lord is like, that's him. Stand up, anoint him. He's mine. That is who I want. And I picture this relationship. Like, here comes David, young teenager. He's been fellowshipping with the Lord every day. He comes in there and the Lord's like, it's time. You're mine. And I have something great in store for you. We know that on that day, the Spirit filled David. At the very same time, the Spirit left Saul. And Saul started to be tormented by an evil spirit that the Lord allowed. The Lord allowed an evil spirit to torment him from the outside. So here David he has the Holy Spirit come upon him, dwells with him, guides him. Saul, who did have the Holy Spirit, it left him. His reign of Israel, in all intents and purposes, stopped that day. And as that Holy Spirit tormented him, Saul's handlers, I call them handlers, Saul's people started to, to think, well, we need to find somebody that can, see, can soothe Saul because he's a little difficult to deal with at this time. And so they, tell, they give Saul this idea. He's like, yeah, okay, who, who do you have in mind? It's like, well, you know, there's this young boy. There's this young boy, and he's an amazing musician. He's a warrior. He's prudent in speaking, like, and God is with him. This is how Saul's people are describing him to Saul. Amazing musician, a warrior already, prudent in speech, and the Lord is with him. And Saul says, yeah, go get him. He, that's who I need. And David starts to minister to Saul at that point in time. And Saul begins to love him so much, he points him his armor bearer. His armor bearer. And I think that that's a beautiful picture, like, this is the Lord's first introduction to David to the court, to the king's court. That's why I, I, love, I love that picture. I love this picture with, with David up here, sitting on the mountain. This, is, this to me represents David's heart. This is where David wants to be fellowshipping with the Lord. If you would, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 1 through 11. I'd like to read this for you. This is the Philistines gathering for battle. And I love this picture. I love this passage. You have, remember, we got we to gotta view this from David's perspective now. Here David is. David is the armor bearer for Saul, but he's also the youngest, and he's still helping his dad, uh, Jesse, with the flock. So right now, you got a picture like David is going back and forth, back and forth. He goes to Saul. He's comforting Saul, doing what he can there, and then he goes home and he's helping his dad, Jesse. So as we read this passage, just know that David is with Jesse right now, his dad. His dad. 1 Samuel 17, chapter, or chapter 17, verse 1 says, Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Socha, which belongs to Judah. And they camped between Socha and Ezekah in Ephes Damon. Saul and the men of Israel were assembled and camped in the valley of Elah, and they drew up in battle formation to confront the Philistines. The Philistines were standing on the mountain on one side, while Israel was standing on the mountain on the other side, with the valley between them. The valley of Elah, just so you know, is about a mile wide. A mile wide. I was trying to get an illustration or a picture of what that would represent here in Prescott. And I, I know some of you are, are crazy and you like to hike and whatnot. I, I did all that in the army. I don't like to do that anymore. It hurts my knees. But if you hike Granite Mountain, you got Granite Mountain, if you know where I'm talking about, and then the other, the other peak that's near Granite, Little Granite Mountain, as a crow flies, that's two nautical miles between peak to peak. 
two nautical miles. So here, they're in, you have the Philistines on one side, Israel on the other, the mountain, um, and the valley in between them. Okay? Then a champion came forward from the army encampment of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath. His height was six cubits in a span. He also had bronze greaves on his legs and bronze sabers slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam and the head of his spear weighed 600 shekels of iron. And his shield carrier walked in front of him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel and said to them, Why do you come out to draw, draw up in battle formation? Am I not the Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man as your representative and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight me and kill me, then we will become your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. Then the Philistine said, I have defied the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man so that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and very fearful. Now, a better word for champion, a better word for champion in the ancient text is mediator. Mediator, or the one who stands between. Goliath stood between the two armies. So each day these armies would get up, they'd go face each other, face off with each other, and Goliath would come down and defy Israel, taunt them. Now, Goliath, he was a pretty big guy. Pretty big guy. And I know the, the person doing the, the video, I'm trying to not go, I'm, but I'm a walker. And I wanna, I'm going to illustrate something to you today. Goliath was six cubits in a span. How tall is that? Nine feet, nine inches tall. If you look over here to the balcony, where these lights are, where I'm pointing, on both sides, if you were to measure from the floor to where that ceiling is, right where that balcony starts, that's nine feet, ten inches. Goliath, if he took off his helmet, could just walk underneath that. Can you imagine that? So as you leave, go stand over there. I, I did that when I measured, and I'm six feet tall. I asked Jake today how tall he was. He's six foot four. He's probably the tallest guy in here. I'm, I'm just guessing, right? David was a teenager. Teenager. I went and measured that a couple weeks ago, and I'm thinking to myself, wow. That's a big dude. That's a big dude, right? His armor weighed 125 pounds. 125 pounds. To put that in perspective for you, when I get ready for work as a law enforcement officer, I put on my bulletproof vest, I put, I put on my weapon, my ammo, my tourniquet, all, all sorts of tools, less lethal options, my boots, it's 30 pounds. His, 125 pounds. The tip of his spear, the head of his spear, 15 pounds. Just the tip. That was the Philistine champion. That is an enormous individual. The tallest man that has ever been recorded in our history, his name was Robert Wadlow. Robert Wadlow. Robert Wadlow was 8 feet 11.1 inches tall. He weighed 490 pounds. I would venture to guess that he probably wasn't as swift and couldn't move like Goliath probably could move. But that gets, gives you an example. So he would stand over, the, Robert Wadlow would stand over there and probably would come up just to the top of that speaker. And Goliath was a, almost a foot taller than that. Amazing. Amazing. Now, as David, teenager, right, he leaves Jesse's house. Jesse sends him to go check on his three older brothers who were actually on the battle lines. He says, hey, take some food to them. Take some food to them. So he takes the, the supplies and he gets there and what does he see? What does he see? He's enraged. 
He's, he's absolutely um, enraged and disappointed. You have, you have this Philistine who is coming and challenging God's army every day. And so you have to picture, as, as we read this next passage, I want you to picture the Holy Spirit within, within David and how the Holy Spirit must be feeling right now with David. And this is just my human picture, but I, I, just keep that in mind. Like David is filled with the Holy Spirit. Saul is not, right? So let's read 1 Samuel uh, 17 uh, chapter. We're going to read um, a few of these verses here. So David gets up early in the morning, left the flock with a keeper, and took the supplies and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the entrenchment, encircling the camp while the army was going out in battle formation, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines drew up in battle formation, army against army, and David left the baggage in the care of the baggage keeper and ran to the battle line. And he entered and greeted his brothers. Now, we won't go into how his brothers greeted him back. They weren't real, one of them, we were real happy to see him, right? Now, you think about this. Your older brothers have to watch you get anointed in front of them in the house to be king. And now he's coming and, and he greets his brothers on the battle line. As he was speaking with him, behold, the champion, the Philistine from Gath, nine foot nine inch Goliath, comes up from the army of the Philistines and he spoke these same words and David heard him. When all the men of Israel saw the man, they fled from him and were very fearful. Fearful. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who is coming up? Surely he's coming up to defy Israel. And it will be that the king will make the man who kills him wealthy with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Then David said to the men who were standing by him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and rids Israel of the disgrace? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he has dared to defy the armies of the living God? What I want to paint a picture for you on these verses is a couple of very important things that sometimes we skip over. In Scripture, when you hear or when you read in Scripture, the Lord report, repeat a word twice. That's pretty important. Like in the New Testament where you hear truly, truly or verily, verily. David is going to repeat uncircumcised twice once in verse 26 and once in verse 36. Uncircumcised was a covenant that God had with Israel. And how do you define that? It is a God-ordained relational bond. It's a covenant. God-ordained relational bond. David comes to the front lines and sees God's people God's people cowering to someone who did not belong to God, who was not under the covenant, who had not been cut. See, that cut, when you're circumcised, represented the filth and the sin that was washed away. And if you, re if you, if you were circumcised on the eighth day and you believed that, that was the covenant that you had with God. And if you, if you enjoyed that covenant then your sins would be washed away. God, God would, he would honor that. And here's David. He comes, he comes to, the, to the battlefield and he repeats, who is this uncircumcised Philistine and why are you afraid? What's going to be done? See, I, I think that, that David was ready. He's absolutely ready. I think the Holy Spirit was inside of him and he was like, you, he was, you could hardly contain him. You could hardly contain him. And so I think that we see that uh, coming up. I think in my human mind, I have this show that I, well, I have many, many movies that I like, you know, but maybe the, the law enforcement, I mean, one of the movies that I've, I liked as a kid was Tombstone. Maybe I wasn't quite a kid. It probably came out when I was an adult. You know, but I always like the character Doc Holliday. You know who Doc Holliday is? I just, you know, something, something just spoke to me, 
right? Doc Holliday was kind of the man in the background, but the man who was unafraid of anything. And he was kind of like the guy that was like, you know, he was, you know, you have White Earp up here and White Earp's the one that's getting all the glory and Doc Holliday's back here and he's just kind of sitting. He's like, yeah, okay, you want to fight? We'll fight. I, I don't know why, but when I was studying for this, that's the way I pictured the Holy Spirit. I know that that's probably not biblical, right? <laughs> But I do. I picture David running to the front lines and I, feel, I picture the Holy Spirit is like, who's this guy? Oh, so I'm your huckleberry. Yeah. I got you. You know what that means? Well, you ever look up, I'm your huckleberry? I had to look it up before I used it. You know, I want to make sure it wasn't something really bad. <laughs> it just means I'm your guy. I'm your guy. I'm your guy, no problem. I got this. We got this. So I want you to think about this. As David is going to the front line, teenager, teenager. I don't know how tall David is. He's probably not very big at this point. He's, you know, I have teenagers. I have a Marine and I, have, I had a Ranger. They're teenagers and they were pretty big kids. My Marine is as tall as I am. I don't think he was as tall as that. You have this teenager running the front line, sees this nine foot, nine inch giant. He's like, who the heck is that? And why is this uncircumcised Philistine yelling at God's army? And the Holy Spirit's like, I'm your huckleberry. Let's go. Let's do this. No problem. No problem. See, the covenant, if you think about this, the covenant was like this umbrella of protection for Israel. If you were underneath that covenant... It's not going to keep it from raining, right? But it's going to keep it from raining on you. And I feel that's the picture I get from David. And I think that that was David's heart. David loved God. What do we see after, after this encounter? Like he's, we won't, we won't go through him putting on Saul's armor or anything. But what we will say is, is when he was ready, David approached the front lines. Here's the uncircumcised Philistine. And we see that David responds to the Philistine. And Goliath explains when he sees David, David's got his stick, his sling, responds to David. And what does he say? You come to me with sticks like I'm a dog? Think about that. You come to me with sticks like I'm a dog? David has a great response. Great response. Now remember, the Holy Spirit's in him. You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have taunted. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I will strike you down and remove your head from your body. The Lord will deliver you this day and I will deliver your head from your body. So Goliath starts to come down. He's like, all right, let's do this. Walking down the hill, what does David do? He takes off running. He marries a stone to that sling, 27 meters per second. Goliath had no shot. He had no chance. God was going to deliver him from Israel's army that day. I want to leave you in the time that we have left. I want to share something that I, means a lot to me about what the Holy Spirit does for us each day. And I prayed last night, like last night I was frustrated, last night I had a lot of questions. I'm, you know, dealing with numerous things that, that law enforcement deals with every day, getting briefed. I'm like, Lord, just take this from me. Just take this from me, right? Romans chapter five, verse five. For the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. David was overcome by the Holy Spirit. The love of God is poured out in our hearts. The image is like the pouring out of water from a spring. The pouring out of water from, from a spring. 
the spring that maybe is shut up or sealed, the Holy Spirit comes along and the spring pours out, pours out onto our heart. Another version that you might have, which is maybe a little bit better, says shed abroad, shed abroad. The love of God is shed abroad within our hearts through the Holy Spirit, shed abroad. I don't know if you're like me, but I, I'm kind of, uh, I don't know if it's OCD. You'd have to ask my wife. Of course, you probably know my, but I like my cars clean, right? So I'm a little vain. I, I, I go to Ocean Blue, I don't know, at least once a day. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sometimes twice a day, depending on if it rains. I'm paying for it. Like, I'm a membership. I'm like, well, sometimes I go through there twice. Like, it doesn't get it clean. And I, I'm like, this didn't work, so I take it back through. Well, if you ever go through Ocean Blue, you have an attendant there right before you go through. And they give you two things. They give you this wipe, and they give you this air freshener. What this passage reminds me of is when you open up that air freshener and that perfume permeates in your vehicle... That's what it means by shed abroad. Shed abroad. You open up, that perfume emanates through. It's shedding abroad. So just think about it. The Holy Spirit is coming upon us and the love of God is shedding abroad all over your heart. That's what David is feeling. That's what David in the mountains are feeling. When he was already anointed, like the love of God is being shed abroad in your heart every day, all day. I'll take uh, Val Kilmer up here. It's probably not a good picture of that, you know, being shed abroad. But that's just, that's just my nature, right? But just think about that. If you look at Psalm 27... This is a psalm from David. 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, we get to see the life of David. I feel in his psalms, you get to see the soul of David. Read this with me. This is from David, right? And think about everything that we just talked about with David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is, my def is the defense of my life. Whom should I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. If an army encamps against me, my heart will not fear. If a war arises against me, in spite of this, I am confident. Now, now picture Val Kilmer. <laughs> Just kidding. My heart will not fear. The love of God is shedding abroad on your heart. Every day, like when you have a, a night like I did last night, and you're just frustrated, remember who you belong to and that the Holy Spirit is, is shedding abroad on your heart the love of God. See, I feel like David was a man after God's own heart. doesn't mean he was perfect. Far from it. Far from it. He had very good moments and very bad moments. The difference is when David sinned, it broke God's heart, but it also broke David's heart. That's the integrity of David. We all sin, and your sin breaks God's heart whether you know it or not. And it, it, it steers you away from the purpose that he has for you in this life, his will but it needs to also break our heart. That's the difference. That is the man after God's own heart, emotional, intellectual. When David sinned, it not only broke God's heart, it broke his heart. And you see that in his Psalms. So I have some next steps for you this week. As you go, as you go through um, this world, no matter where you are, no matter what your giants are, you, we all have giants like Goliath. 
And that was, you know, our giants facing our giants wasn't really about today. I just wanted you to picture how David approached it and how David approached life and how we should approach life and where your heart is as you do that. Step one, remember that the Holy Spirit is alive inside you this coming week. So I gave you a picture. This week, just think about Val Kilmer. <laughs> Doc Holliday. Coming to the Philistines. The Holy Spirit is alive inside you and intercedes for you every day. Every day. Every day. I feel, I feel like he's, he's in there interceding for me. You know, he's, thank, thankfully he's interceding for me because I don't do what I should do. Like Paul says, I constantly don't do the things that I should do. I don't do the things that I, I ought to. Or I constantly do the things that I'm not supposed to do and I don't do the things that I should do. He intercedes for us. Thank the Lord for that. Thank the Lord. So remember this week, just remember David coming to the front lines going, hey, what's going on over there? What's up? Oh, everybody's over there. Hey, you hold this stuff for me? Trots over here. He's like, what in the world? And the Holy Spirit's like, ah, let's get him. Let's get him. Just remember that. The Holy Spirit's alive in you. Run towards your giant and fight for God's truth. When you recognize what's going on in your life and you need to fight, fight for God's truth. Fight for God's truth. Let the Holy Spirit guide you in that. And read Psalm 27, 1 through 3 every day. Just those steps this week. Holy Spirit's in you. Fight for God's truth. And read David's Psalms a little bit. So that's what's been on my heart lately. So I, I appreciate you letting me stand up here. You know, I'm not used to, usually when I'm, I'm in front of a crowd, it's probably a community meeting that's yelling back at me because they're unhappy with something. <laughs> but it's, it's a joy to come here and fellowship with you and, and, uh, and just read God's word and fellowship in God's word. Would you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I thank you for the opportunity to come here today to worship you. I thank you for Jake and Jennifer and their the musicians that, that bring melodious song to us. But Lord, as we go through these coming days, would you just remind us that you are inside of us, that you are shedding your love onto our hearts each and every day, moment by moment, constantly interceding on our behalf. May we feel that, Lord. May you impress that upon our hearts. Forgive us for where, where we fail, as we do every day. We do every day. I pray for this congregation, Lord, and I pray for the direction of our church in this upcoming season. I pray that you give Pastor Scott some rest. But I also pray that you equip us each day to fight for your truth. Fight for your truth. And stand up against the evil that is in this world. Be with us today, Lord, um, as we go about uh, remembering you, worshiping you. And Lord, I, we just, we love you. We love you. We can't do this without you. And I just pray that you remind us about that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you.